Tonight we're going to continue on in our Bible study in the book of the Revelation. And the Revelation is a prophetic book. Uh, because it's prophetic, a lot of people stay away from it. They just are kind of scared, but I don't think we should be afraid of reading the Bible and trying to understand it. I will never claim to totally understand it, but um, the more that I read and the more that I study and compare different thoughts and uh, you know different people's perspectives and, and pray, of course, myself and do my own studies and uh, kind of compare the Bible with the Bible. Um, it's The Bible is actually 66 different books gathered together in one volume. So it's really not one book. I've heard it said that if you argue from the Bible, you're using circular reasoning because uh, it's just a book that kind of keeps coming back on itself. But the Bible is actually 66 books with uh, 40 different authors, kings, prophets, shepherds, uh, physicians, a tax collector was in there, a guy from the RS was in there, um, all people from all different kinds of lives and backgrounds and cultures and languages. It's written in uh, Hebrew. It's written in, part of it is in Aramaic, part of it's in Greek. Of course, those ancient languages have been translated into more modern languages so that we can read it in our own language. And, um, and so there's a thread. There's so many threads that run through the Bible, starting at the book of Genesis all the way to the end in the book of the Revelation here. And so it's interesting that it's not one book. The Bible is actually like an encyclopedia of 66 books. And the authors are separated by thousands of years. But because I believe it's divinely inspired that, you know, the author, the real author is God. And then he uh, encourages and inspires uh, people to write these things down. And then they've been collected. And uh, fortunately, over the centuries, translated into languages that we can read in our, so we can understand it. God wants his book, books his his volume uh, to be understood. Uh, it's not something to just put on the coffee table um, and kind of use as a good luck charm. It's a it's an instruction manual, if you will, but it's also a love letter. It doesn't just tell us how to live and 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 that, but it tells us how much God loves us and um, and how to receive His love and how to walk in His love and how to share that love with others. It also warns us. It warns us to not sin. It warns us against false religions. It warns us. Like any good parent warning a child, they'll love the child and encourage them, but they'll also warn them and, and, and tell them to stay away from certain things. And so the book is completely comprehensive in all of those things. So, and it's divinely inspired. And it even de declares about itself that the, the Bible says about itself that it's the living word of God. I think what that means is that you can read it and it will be kind of, I don't want, it's not the best word to use, but activated, if you will, for the situation that you are in. God can really drive a, a point home and give us clear direction uh, for the things that we're going through. You know, you might be at a crossroads making a decision or you might be struggling with fear. God says, don't fear, you know, uh, because I am with you. It's interesting that every time Jesus told his disciples to not be afraid, he always said, don't be afraid, I'm here. So it's not, the situation wasn't don't be afraid because it's going to change or the, the, the storm's going to go away, but don't be afraid, I'm here. So the Bible just covers every human emotion. It covers every need that we have. It tells us the way to have a relationship with God. Um, it is very, very uh, reliable as an ancient document, and that's a whole other study. But, you know, when we study ancient books like uh, Homer and Socrates and those things, we take the copies that we have and we put them together and we, we see how much in agreement they are. The more copies that we have and the more in agreement that they are, you know, and these were hand copied. So you, you, you always want to allow for scribal secretarial error in copying, copious errors. Uh, some of those books, we only have 10 or 12 copies of them uh, in existence. And they are, you know, 700 or 1,000 years removed from the original copy. And yet those books are taught in universities, you know, as fact. Uh, the Bible has over 26, the New Testament has over 26,000 copies available in the world today in the ancient language. And it's only 100 years removed uh, from the original autographs. And so uh, just that way, the Bible is a very, very reliable book. I mean, set faith aside for a moment. If you wanted to know 
if something is worth reading and can you trust it, you, you trace it back to its roots. And um, it's, consider this, if you're on a, if there's 10 people on a street corner and there's a car accident, the police come and interview 10 people, they might get 70% of the, of the, of the facts that they agree upon. The other 30%, they're not in agreement. So they'll throw out that 30%, but the other 70% are in agreement. So you can be pretty sure that those things for sure happened. That's how we measure the reliability of ancient documents. And so the Bible, in that sense, very, very reliable, just from a, a technical point of view, if you will, as a, as a book of ancient literature. But it's certainly more than a book of ancient literature. So I wasn't ex expecting to go off on all of that, but we started kind of on time, even a few minutes early. So get a little extra credit there. Anyway, it's a shorter uh, Bible study tonight. We're in the book of the Revelation. Chapter three, the book of the Revelation, as I started, a book of prophecy. Some people are afraid of it. Some pastors will never teach it. Um, the book is filled with, uh, in the later chapters, filled with a lot of visions and um things that God shows to the Apostle John, and they are things that can't be explained really in human language. Um, John often says, I saw something like, or then I saw something like, and he's explaining the visions that he's having. But um, if we keep connecting the dots in the book of the Revelation, we come up with a storyline that is uh, easily followed, I think. Yeah, the book of the Revelation requires some work. I've taught it about three times now, and, and um, I remember the first time I taught it, I was scared to death. I thought, what am I doing? I should just leave this to the professionals, you know. Um, but I'm a pastor, and I'm a Christian. I should read it, I should study it, and I needed to teach it. And so the more I study, the more I read, the more I connect the dots, um, the more I understand. So with, any, with anything that you're ever reading, uh, you know, Bible or not, um, don't worry about what you don't understand. Just read it and get something out of it. And then when you come circle back around again, you'll understand more, especially true with the Bible. Um, everybody uh, who's a, a Christ follower should be reading the Bible every day. And, and I would encourage anybody watching this to read the Bible and, and see if God speaks to you about some things. Uh, read it with an open, sincere heart, though, of course. You don't you want to read it looking for reasons to not believe it. But um, anyway, we're in the book of the Revelation. And... Um, John is having these visions and he's having these interactions with the risen Christ. Jesus has already been killed, put in the tomb, raised on Easter Sunday, what we call Easter Sunday. And for 50 days after that appeared to his disciples. John is now having a, a vision of the risen Christ as he looks in heaven. And so that's the, that's the setting. Jesus is showing him things to come. He's also showing him things about certain churches that existed there in Asia Minor in that first century. So just six verses, Revelation 3, verse 1. Let me just read the whole thing, and, we'll, and then we'll come back and consider some things. To the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect or complete or mature before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So. I'm just going to read from my notes. I, I put the notes on my Facebook page, and I we always start our studies with a little bit of history. You know, if I was going to be uh, giving you a message about the Napa Valley, I would tell you what the Napa Valley is, is about. We don't grow corn here, we grow grapes. Um, it's not desert, it's a, a fertile valley, etc. So um, Sardis was a place that existed in that first century, and there was a church there, and Jesus saw that church, and this is one of the seven churches in the book of the Revelation that he gives no, no commendation for, nothing but correction. So let me read to you the history of Sardis. It matters. Um, at the time of this writing, Sardis was in decline, a well-known place of wealth and decadence. So it's like, you know, the place you go on your vacation, you save all that money, you do things you would never do in your own home city, and then you go home and you don't tell anybody about it. It's that kind of place. Even the pagans spoke of Sardis with a degree of contempt. So it was just a place of luxury, uh, overindulgence of every form. 
well located. It was located at the inter intersection of five main roads. So it had a, a constant influx of visitors that would come and just party. I mean, perhaps a little bit, a, a modern day comparison might be like Las Vegas. You know, when you, when you go to Vegas, um, you know, there's lots of sayings about Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, another name for Las Vegas is Lost Wages. And I'm sure you guys are thinking of other uh, nicknames that describe kind of a lot of people go to Las Vegas and they just go crazy and then they go back to normal living. Well, that's the kind of place that Sardis was. It was a well-known place of the worship of Sibylle, a, a, a pagan goddess who was worshiped with sexual impurity. So that goes right along with that whole idea of overindulgence. It was a, one where, a place where somebody could easily make money. And in fact, modern day money was first minted there in the city of Sardis. So it was, they were very concerned about money and uh, uh, self-gratification. Overall, Sardis was known for softness, luxury, apathy, immorality, and a lack of self-discipline. Just go and live it up. Live like, a, live like a hog and die like a dog kind of thing. It was just a place where you would party down, as uh, uh, we used to say in the old days. And um, Budweiser commercial with Spuds McKenzie. He would just go crazy, this little crazy dog that was just a beer-drinking fool. So that was the place, that's the kind of place that Sardis was. Militarily is an interesting, it was, it was built kind of like, um, if, if you imagined my, my hands like this as an outcropping from a, a mountain, uh, Sardis was, had three sides and was built on this outcropping of three sides. So, it, and it had sheer walls, pretty much sheer walls. So militarily, it was more easy to, um, to defend. Uh, armies couldn't go be scaling up those walls. I mean, it would just be incredibly difficult. And if anybody at all was watching, you could easily discern them. They couldn't hide and you could easily, uh, you know, do away with them. However, there was two times in the history of Sardis, uh, King Cyrus in uh, 549 BC and Antiochus the Great in 214 BC, both of those kings conquered uh, for a time in the city of Sardis as they studied it from a distance, uh, they saw, and this same thing happened twice, uh, a soldier dropped his helmet and it kind of came down the, the hillside. So the soldier would, would take a trail that they knew about down, retrieve the helmet, and then come back up. So from a distance, you couldn't see any access, but uh, the access was there, but it was difficult to see. Twice the city was conquered because the soldiers were like asleep at the wheel. They were just, they, would, they just considered themselves uh, unconquerable. Everything's fine. We don't have to try. We can just kick back. We're soldiers. We're supposed to be on watch, but we're, they were probably sleeping because it was just this idea of we are unbeatable. Everything's fine. It's always going to be fine. And so they were, they were historically, they were militarily conquered two times. In verse one, look at verse one again. Jesus is talking to this city and he says, um, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So Jesus always describes himself in a way that is um, appropriate to the people that he's talking. Um, if you were going to, you know, if you needed to hire a lawyer, he would give you his degrees. He would tell you his background. If you were hiring a, a computer technician, he would give you his degrees. Hi, I'm, I'm Timmy Jones, and uh, this is who I am, and this is what I do. Jesus here is giving his credentials, and this is what he says. I have the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We discovered in chapter one, the seven spirits of God simply means, and biblically, that the number seven always points to kind of the fullness or the, or the, the maximum of a particular thing. So Jesus here is basically saying, I'm full of the spirit of God and the seven stars uh, were the seven, um, I can't remember now, verse chapter one, either the angels of the church or the churches themselves. Basically, Jesus is, is here saying, I know what's going on. You know, you appear to be like a healthy bunch of people, but you're really not. And I really see what's going on with you. Jesus had said in his days in the flesh, when he lived as man, he said, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So Jesus here is saying, look, at you're a dead church. You're going through emotions. Um, physically, you're doing things. There are activities. Perhaps there was civic activities. Perhaps there was, uh, you know, a feeding 
homeless people or, or giving clothes to poor people or, you know, repainting whatever building they were meeting in or anything like that. There was things going on. There was physical activity. But physical activity in the Bible doesn't always uh, equal spiritual activity. A church can be busy doing a lot of things, but accomplishing nothing eternal. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He says, you're known for, you know, for having some activity there, but none of it is from me. None of it represents me. None of it pleases me. I didn't ask you to do any of it. And uh, for eternity, none of, that's, none of it's going to matter. You're spinning your wheels. You're doing nothing. So look at, at the... Uh, look at the second part of verse one. Jesus says, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. So there it is. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. So when the people, you know, if people in Sardis were looking for a church, oh, let's go to the church of Sardis. Oh, boy, that's really happening. They have a church bulletin and they're doing so much and they're doing this and that. And they have these things for the youth and all this other stuff. And, you know, I'm not saying that all activity is bad, but I'm saying it's possible to have activity with no spiritual life in it. It's just going through the motions. Look at verse two, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found your works perfect or complete before God. So there was a few things that were still kind of had the spirit of God in them. But for the most part, all the, all the activity at Sardis uh, was just man powered and man designed and man inspired. I want to encourage you, if you ever find yourself uh, looking for a church, you know, um, why do people go to church or how do they decide what church to go to? Well, my kids like it. Okay, well, we want our kids to like church, but sometimes kids like things that aren't so great for them, including church. It can be dressed up to be something as good, but it's really just uh, kind of a glorified babysitting and, and it's nothing more than a social club uh, without drugs and alcohol or <laughs> without any kind of philandering going on. So, you know, just because a church has activity doesn't mean that it's a spiritual church. Some people will, will go to church. I've heard this so many times here in the Napa Valley. I go to that church because my friends go there. Hey, I want to go to church with my friends too. But I don't want to go to a church that's dead and do dead things with my dead or semi-comatose friends. I want to do things that God is into and that he's promoting and that he's inspiring people's hearts to do. And so there's lots of bad reasons to choose a particular church, Sardis here, well, look at your notes or look at your, the, the Bible again, verse one, I know your works. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Now he's going to say here, there's a few things that are alive. So uh, I envision the church at Sardis as being in a coma, but able to wiggle uh, the big toe on one foot. There's a little bit of life there and life could come back. But for the most part, they're, they're just a, a humanly, power to church and God's not not powering them. They may have been doing things without love. The Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13. They might be feeding the homeless, but they don't love the homeless. They might be doing things without faith. They're doing them because they know they should, or they're doing them simply because they're able to, but they won't let themselves get stretched or taken out of their spiritual comfort zone. They might be doing things to receive the recognition of man, and, and Christians are not immune from that, and church-going people are People of faith of, of all kinds of rank and file are not immune from that. Some we we can all be tempted with that. And everybody loves to be recognized, you know. And so you can do some things. I mean, I could do it. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor thirty. I was just counting the other day, thirty four years now. Hey, I, I I know how to do some things to get attention. I've been around. I've seen other people do it. I have a sinful tendency that's still there that needs to be kind of held back. And so you know, we can do some spiritual so-called spiritual things for the applause of men. And we just don't want to do that. And um, so be careful in your own life, of course, and, and be careful about the church that you'll choose to go to. And then, of course, there's the whole cultural thing about, uh, you know, choosing a church that, that, that is guided by the mores of the culture and not guided by the, by the morals of God. I'll just leave it there. You, you guys know all the different possibilities of what I'm talking about. The church is supposed to be light in darkness. When the, when the darkness starts telling the church how to act, that church is nearly dead or, or, or dead. And so that's what Jesus is talking about. 
But but even even in spite of that, look, Jesus is still encouraging them. It's it's a wonderful thing. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. I have not found your works perfect before God. And once again, that word perfect in the Greek language, the New Testament's written in Greek, it simply means mature or complete. They're not everything that they should be. There might be a little something there, but they're not everything that they should be. So there's room for improvement. So Jesus is saying, come on, guys, uh, do it the way that you know is supposed to be done. Verse three, verse two, he says, watch and strengthen yourself. And then it begs the question, well, how do I do that? Verse three is the answer. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. He's telling them there was a time in your life when you were first following me, when you first loved me, when you first wanted to serve me. This is Jesus talking to them. And uh, you used to receive my words with joy. You were eager to hear what I had to say. You And, and for Christians, by and large, we, we get our direction and our communication from God via the Bible. It can certainly come other ways, but sometimes those ways are hard to discern. Is that me or is that you kind of thing? But if it's the Bible, we know that that Bible is there. It didn't change from what it was yesterday. So he's saying, you guys need to be watchful and strengthen that which remains. And then he tells them how to do it. He says, remember how it was at the beginning when you used to listen to me, when you when you were happy uh, to pick up your Bible, when you were happy to hear a pastor or somebody, a man or a woman, tell you the truth about the Bible. Remember how you used to be? Be that way again. Be eager. I, I've... I talk to some people sometimes and, and they say, you know, I ask God to make me eager, but he just doesn't seem to be making me eager. I ask God to change my heart because I know I should make it a priority to read my Bible because I don't want to be stuck in my own head. I, I, want, I, want, to, I want God's thoughts and God's mind to be in me, but he's just not giving me the eagerness. And my response to them is, do you know you should do it? Yes. Well, then you should do it. If you, if you do what you know you should do, your heart will catch up. Conversely, and I like to play devil's advocate with people just to get people thinking. Has it, has it been 100% good every time you followed your feelings? There's not a person on earth that can say it, that it is. Following our feelings, following my feelings has gotten me in trouble many times. I've never gotten in trouble once by picking up the Bible and reading it. It's only been, sometimes it's been boring to me. I've had trouble concentrating. You know, certain books of the Bible are tough for me to read. I have to try harder. But I've never walked away damaged. I've never walked away being led astray or being tempted or being lied to or being confused. And so this church here needed to be watchful that, you know, they were almost in a coma. They could wiggle the little toe. And Jesus is telling them how to get life back in the body again, how to get life back in the church, how to get life back in their own hearts. And they would say, well, how? And he says, get back to how you used to do it. And their response might be, well, I just don't feel it anymore. Well, forget your feelings. Pick up God's word or listen to it. I mean, we have so much available now to us, don't we? You know, uh, podcasts and online and audio books and Bibles and devotional books. And we have all of these things, YouTube videos. Turn it on. Don't say, God, give me the desire to turn it on. And then, you know, wait until you're overwhelmed to push, you know, the on button. Turn it on. Pick up the Bible, read it. Listen to a podcast. And then God will stir your heart again. Imagine if we did that physically with ourselves. I'm having a heart attack. I, I just don't feel like getting up and driving to the hospital. And I just, you know, but I, I, but I want to live. I want to live, but I, I just, I don't know if I can make it. It's a long drive. And what if there's traffic and my, the brakes aren't good on my car? And, you know, what if they don't take me into the hospital right away? And this and that? Get in the car and go, <laughs> you know, that way they can help you. And this is what, you know, Jesus is saying to this church. 
you've got a little bit of life in you. But if you want the life to come back, you know, and I'm thinking of a Beatles song, sorry, get back to where you once belonged. Get back. Get back to that first love. People think you're doing great, but you're not. And Jesus is always kind of doing this, you know. It's like, I, I see what's happening with you, you know. But he's inviting them back in, guys. That's the great news. He's inviting this church back in. He has nothing good to say about them. But he still wants them and he still loves them. That's an amazing thing. Remember verse 3. How you have, there, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. <laughs> repent means to turn around, change your direction. If you, if you don't watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, this whole idea of coming like a thief, when is it dangerous for a household regarding a thief? It's dangerous for a household. Regarding a thief, it's dangerous for a household when they're not watching. If they're watching, they're not surprised. They hear you know, somebody rattling the door, trying to open a window, and they can protect themselves and they can defend themselves and they're not taken by surprise and they don't suffer loss. It's dangerous for, for somebody when they, when they think, ah, we're fine, I'm fine, just like the people at Sardis. Nobody's gonna attack us. We have life of luxury. We're living in Vegas. Life is good. Live it up, you know, that kind of thing. And so Jesus is saying, you know, I kind of might show up uh, with, you know, my grandma Mary. She was a little Mexican gal and she had a slipper, a little felt slipper called the chancla, you know. And if anybody's Latinos out there, you know what I mean. Grandma Mary would spank us with a chancla, you know. Jesus is saying, look at, if you don't take care of yourself, I'm going to show up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct you and I'm going to discipline you. God disciplines his children in love. It says in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, my sons don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by him for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son that he receives. So Jesus isn't talking about coming and, and you know, destroying them or something like that. He's, he's saying, I'm going to come and, uh, in a way, it's going to be kind of too late because if I come, it, it's not going to be good, you know. But I love you. You're mostly dead. I think of the movie Princess Bride. Is he dead? No, he's only mostly dead. <laughs> if you watch the movie, you'll get the joke. But Jesus wants this church. He wants these people, you know. And so he's showing them the way back. And then he says in verse 4, this is crazy. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The pagan religions, uh, to practice them, you had to, um, you had to dress in white. So Jesus is saying, there's a few people, there's a few Christians there that haven't defiled their garments, and they're going to walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And they're worthy because Jesus died for their sins and, and has forgiven them, and they are considered not guilty. It's really interesting, though, in verse 4, you have a few names, even in Sardis. I would suggest to you and submit to you that there are some cities where it is harder to follow God than in other cities. And Sardis was a tough place to, to be a Jesus follower. But there were some that were doing it still. Maybe they were just the life in, in the big toe, you know. And, uh, and so Jesus is saying, even, even there, in other words, you can't use the excuse that it's too hard to be a Christian in Sardis. And he's saying, not for some of them. So the rest of you, catch up. Repent. Come back to me. And then he gives them this wonderful uh, promise. And it's kind of a warning at the same time in verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There's an easy part to this verse and a harder part to this verse. The easy part is he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. It just speaks of purity. It speaks of approval. To overcome in Sardis, it means you just, you stay alive. You maintain your relationship. How does somebody, and if any of you have gone through divorce, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you've been through a divorce. I am. 
how does a marriage get destroyed? Somebody quits. Every marriage will have challenges and problems. But how do you overcome getting divorced? You just don't quit. And I think this is what Jesus is talking about. He who overcomes in Sardis, don't quit. Don't give in. Don't, live, don't start living that decadent life. Don't complain that I'm not excited as I used to be. Or, and and how, how, how encouraging do you think it was going to the church at Sardis? It wasn't. It was a dead church. You know, you, you go to church looking for some encouragement. You're not going to find too much of it there. But some of them were doing well. And they were overcoming. Once again, don't miss this, guys. He's inviting everybody to hang in there and to press forward and to repent and to not die on the vine. So he says, for those who will, I won't blot his name out of the, from the book of life. This is a very controversial verse. There seems to be verses in the Bible that say, if you are a Christian, God's going to keep you. There are other verses like this one that says, if you're a Christian, you better hang in there and you're not going to be blotted out of the book of life. That verse standalone seems to indicate that that is possible. And yet there are other verses uh, in the Bible that seem to tell the other side of the story. There's two sides of the same coin. No way I can tackle that here. But, the, but it's a strong verse and, and maybe somebody that's listening needs to hear it. You don't want your name blotted out of the book of life. But you do want your name confessed before my father and before his angels. When this whole thing wraps up, you want, you want Jesus to say, Father, this one is mine. And how does that happen? You don't quit. And if you're tempted to quit, you repent. And you don't wait to, till you feel like repenting. You repent because you know to. The man with the heart attack doesn't wait till he feels like getting in the car to drive. You get in the car and you drive. You get there and you get to where the help is. And so that's what he's asking these people. In verse six, he says this, simply an invitation to listen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so the letter is for all the churches. It's for all seven of those churches. It's for every church today. It's for every Christian today. It's for every person on earth today to listen to this and, and, to, and to consider Jesus. Uh, I know there are some Christians watching. I know that there may be some others who are not Christians that are watching. I really want to encourage you to consider Jesus, you know. Um, in a very big generalization, um, and I, I'm sure there would be some uh, disagreement with me on this, but from what I see from a lot of the major religions in the world, they, they show us how to get to heaven, you know, if you will, or to get to nirvana or, or whatever it is that the final destination is for somebody. But that's up to us. You know, it's, it's works based. Uh, with Christianity, Jesus came down to us. And the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. You know, every good judge on the earth should punish bad guys. If they don't, they're not a good judge. God's no different. But he's the judge that offers us mercy. And he gives us mercy by letting someone else pay for our crimes, his son. And so uh, if you've never said yes to Jesus, I really want to encourage you to consider him. Uh, pick up the Bible, pick up the Gospel of John. Uh, read the Gospel of John if you're interested, only if you're interested. If, if not, don't bother. But if you are, and with an honest heart, just say, God, if you're real, if you're there, I'm ready. And I think he'll, he'll spark your heart. I really do. That's what happened to me. It's happened to so many that I know. So thank you so much for watching, um, either live and or uh, later on as I, you know, upload this to my YouTube page. I do have a YouTube channel, Pastor Bill Walden, uh, Build Up the Church. And so I have a lot of videos there you can watch. I do have a website called Build Up the Church. You can see where I'm going to be traveling in the near future. And um, I am pastoring, again, Cornerstone Fellowship Napa. If you want to look us up online, uh, you can kind of look about the church. And if you're ever in the Napa area, come visit us. That would be great. And uh, stay for lunch because we always have lunch after church. So, okay. Um,
I'm not going to go through the list of people, I, but I've been enjoying this watching who's who's watching. And so, guys, thank you for um, for tuning in. I really uh, am blessed that anybody would ever want to tune in for this. So we'll see you next week, Lord willing. Uh, read ahead in Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 7. Read about the next church, okay? Thanks, guys, so much. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are good and you love humanity. Uh, you're also incredibly holy, and you say it like it is. And those two things are not exclusive at all, but they are perfectly describing who you are. Full of mercy, full of grace, full of love, but also you draw the line. And, um, and then you make us acceptable if we say yes to it. So thank you. Bless, bless these listeners, these viewers. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, guys, God bless you. Thanks. Bye-bye.